Excellent. Uh, thanks for having me, Karen. Thanks for the uh, invite. And I'm excited to be here and see a full room of engaged uh, people who care about ALD and want to see uh, change happen. What I um, thought I would do today is, um, beyond the Starbeam study, give you a little update, as I think uh, Karen and Sarah were asking for, about uh, research in general in the, in the U.S. and talk about uh, new approaches to gene correction. First and foremost, the Starbeam study, um, which is um, a first gene therapy trial for uh, boys with childhood cerebral ALD that builds on uh, the wonderful work um, by Dr. Borg and Dr. Cartier. But then I will also speak to why we need other approaches for other phenotypes that this uh, mode of gene correction um, that will work for um, childhood cerebral ALD will not work for AMN and where we have other opportunities and other technology. And then I will go a little bit into new insights into pathophysiology and, and close with open questions similar to um, um, what was mentioned before. What are we actually missing? What will really help us close the gaps and bring uh, trials and successful treatment to all patients regardless of phenotype? <clears throat> so this will be a mixed presentation both hopefully uh, for, uh, for patients and for people who uh, don't have a biology background but uh, also for the scientists. Um, and I'll try to keep the term simple Feel free to interrupt if you don't understand something. So ALD, in, in a nutshell, is a single gene disorder. Okay? We know uh, the, the gene that was identified by Dr. Bourke is um, being ABCD1, which encodes a peroxisomal half-transporter. This sits on, on the membrane of a part of the cell. Okay? And uh, because this, uh, uh, this protein is not functional, there is a buildup of these abnormal lipids called very long chain fatty acids. Until this point, everything seems to make sense and is uniform. What, um, what then creates heterogeneity is the insight that there are actually different manifestations of the single gene disorder. You can have inflammatory demyelination of the brain, you can have uh, a spinal cord uh, disease that is non inflammatory in nature. Uh, called AMN, and then uh, you can also have adrenal insufficiency alone. So I will now uh, talk briefly to the different uh, neurology phenotypes and show you how we can bring about gene correction um, for uh, both AMN and cerebral ALD. So AMN, you know, the most common manifestation, and really the part of the disease that we really need to tackle next, I think, because it affects the most patients worldwide, um, and, and as you all know, uh, leads on with a lifelong disability. And um, we do have an animal model uh, for this disease, and we hope to make use of that to bring progress. Um, what I will show you next is how for cerebral ALD, we've achieved first gene correction, um, despite not having an animal model available but because we had insight into the disease process, because we had a good uh, way of tracking disease using brain MRI. <coughs> so brain MRI is fine, but how do we actually measure neurologic progression uh, in, in particular this latest trial that we conducted called the Starbeam study? We uh, took a measure called the neurologic function score, and that's been used for the last 10, 20 years. And there were particular domains that we thought were particularly important. And these six most important uh, domains are major functional disabilities that we focused on within the trial. You see them highlighted here in, in bold. As I mentioned before, one advantage in the cerebral form of the disease is the fact that brain MRI can track disease progression, an advantage we don't really have in, in AMN or adrenal myelinopathy. So uh, what do you see on brain MRI? Usually, um, as was alluded to earlier, there's a lesion in the, in the center of the brain, the corpus callosum, that then spreads outward over time. And we can use a scoring system from 0 to 34 that shows the progression of that lesion as it extends outward in the white matter. 
Another characteristic of the brain MRI is that there is inflammation, and this inflammation shows up through contrast enhancement. And you see on the right-hand part of this slide this garland of contrast enhancement that goes around the lesion, and that is indicative for the active inflammatory, very aggressive stage of the disease. <clears throat> so cerebral ALD, as mentioned before by uh, Professor Stewart, is really currently only treated in early stages by uh, allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. And if uh, treated in the early stages, can dramatically improve uh, five-year survival, as you see here in the blue line, compared to the untreated in the red line. Now, why does this work? One of the reasons we think this works is because, as you see in the top right side of this slide, there is a band of cells that are around the lesion that are called microglia that are dying early in the course of the disease. And as those cells die, the demyelination, the myelin loss progresses. So we think when you perform a bone marrow transplantation, you are able to introduce new bone marrow-derived monocytes, and these go into the brain, and they now replace those microglia that are dying in the brain. So while allogeneic bone marrow transplantation works in the early uh, stages of the disease, there are also significant risks. Uh, one in 10 uh, boys who uh, uh, die due to the treatment itself, and many more experience side effects, such as graft-versus-host or um, engraftment uh, uh, failures. And sadly, 49% of ALD transplants are performed with mismatched, unrelated donors, which, uh, which add uh, where, where these complications are much more frequent. So a seminal study was conducted in, uh, in 2009 where uh, Dr. Abour and Dr. Cartier um, had two patients in, uh, in their clinic where they couldn't find an HLA-matched uh, uh, donor, and they decided they were going to take their own cells, autologous cells, and transfect these cells with a lentiviral vector restoring the, the uh, mutant gene. And what they found was that within 14 to 16 months after this procedure, the boys stabilized. So this was really a very pioneering uh, study and then led um, to uh, our current trial, which uses a very similar self-inactivating uh, <coughs> virus to uh, replace uh, the ABCD1 gene in uh, bone marrow cells. So here's the Starbeam study. It's a single arm phase 2 3 study of LENTD and cerebral ALD. It's important that the eligibility criteria for the study were identical to that of conventional allogeneic bone marrow transplantation. It means that the boys um, all had to have an early brain lesion um, with evidence of contrast enhancement. Um, importantly, we excluded any boys who had a matched a sibling donor for bone marrow transplantation. And then we tracked exactly the things I just mentioned before, which is we looked at uh, the neurologic function score, we looked at major functional disabilities, and we also looked at the brain MRI and we said, what happens to contrast enhancement? What happens to the lesion? Does it progress? And probably most importantly, because this was an experimental study, it was important to us to make sure that this was all done safely and that we recorded any uh, ad adverse events that occurred during this trial. So how uh, is this gene therapy performed? So uh, the boy's um, um, uh, stem cells are mobilized um, through uh, apheresis. We, we give uh, them a stimulating factor where those uh, cells are then found in the peripheral blood. These cells are harvested and then they're transduced with a lentiviral vector, and then after a little bit of uh, immune suppression, uh, cyclophosphamide, um, bucelfen, the cells are given back. Importantly, all this is very uh, is, uh, similar to what you see in a conventional bone marrow transplantation, with the difference that these are autologous cells, so these are cells from the boys themselves. So we enrolled 18 boys. One a boy was ineligible um, at the time of screening since the diagnosis was the disease was too advanced. We treated 17 of these boys 
uh, 11 of them at the site in Boston. Important uh, that now three of them have reached two years and um, all of them are more than six months out from the procedure. They were all asymptomatic at the time of enrollment and their uh, lesion was at an early stage uh, of the disease. So here are the results. So we find that um, their neurologic function scores uh, stabilized in 16 of 17 boys. They all remain free from major functional disabilities. This is dramatically different from what you see in historical controls as seen on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, so, so we feel this is uh, uh, so far, knock on wood, um, really uh, fantastic results uh, that we've achieved. They are similar to what you would see with a conventional bone marrow transplant, as shown again on, in the right-hand slide with the historical control. So over time, you see uh, stabilization with both, both uh, uh, these uh, procedures. So the neurologic function scores are uh, here plotted on the, on the uh, y-axis and time on the x-axis. So that stabilization of the neurologic progression is also mirrored in what we look at on imaging. So here is a, a boy who exemplifies what we actually saw. At the time that he was enrolled, he had the classic lesion within the corpus callosum um, um, and also contrast enhancement as seen down here. And after treatment, the contrast enhancement went away <coughs> and over time, the lesion stabilized. Uh, in my experience, this is very different than what you would, you, you would have seen over time, uh, where boys that usually progress in this time period and then show a scan similar to what you see on the right, where you have extension of the white matter into the subcortical regions and also a garland of contrast enhancement that has grown over time. <coughs> okay, so just suffice it to see, say that uh, we really saw this pattern in all uh, boys over time. And, uh, and that 14 of 17 stabilized in their MRI scoring system. So, sorry, Dr. Reichler, is yeah. there a way you can move that way, or the oh. slide can move that way? Or well, in front of the table, probably, but this side of the room you can't see. Yeah. Sorry about that. The legs look really nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Good. I was going to skip over the slide, but if people <laughs> don't like this slide, I'm going to uh, hover and explain this here, here a little bit. So, in the, in the orange circles, what you see is the contrast enhancement, which we think is sort of pathognomonic for this active form of the disease. What you see in the green uh, circles is when the contrast goes away. You can see that contrast enhancement resolved in uh, 16 of 17 patients by six months, but in some of the patients we saw re-emergence of the contrast enhancement at 12 months. And this is shown here in these um, orange circles. In two of them, uh, when you followed up on the next brain MRI, you saw that the contrast enhancement disappeared. What's important, however, to note is that all these boys in which we speak of re-emergence of contrast enhancement, their enhancement is much less extensive than compared to that of screening. <clears throat> so let me just show you this here on the right-hand side. This is screening contrast enhancement. And you can see that on follow-up at 12 months, it's far less extensive. So even though we speak of re-emergence, it is much less extensive. So how do we know now that the gene actually got in uh, and that the effects are durable? You see now on the left-hand side is the vector copy number um, in peripheral blood. And in all boys, vector copy number is detected and persisted. Uh, up to last follow-up. And more importantly, when you looked at um, ALD protein expression, the, the protein that's actually expressed from the gene <coughs> delivered, that that ALD protein expression is found in 20% of peripheral blood monocytes at 12 months, as shown in the graph on the right. So coming to safety, we found that the study procedures were generally well tolerated. There was no graft failure or graft versus host. Uh, there were no deaths. Um, there was no um, clonal dominance or sign of insertional mutagenesis. The side effects and adverse events we did see were consistent with those uh, seen with uh, myeloblative condition. <coughs> so what you would expect under a conventional bone marrow transplantation. 
So let me just summarize this here uh, uh, briefly and say that all patients remain free of major functional disabilities to date. Um, stabilization of their neurologic function score was found in 16 of 17 in patients and their imaging stabilized in 14 of 17. Gadolinium enhancement was much less extensive after treatment in, in all patients and we didn't find any deaths, any graft failure or graft versus host. So we think that this approach of uh, NTD gene therapy may be an alternative, particularly for those boys who are uh, lacking a matched sibling donor. And, uh, and this is really uh, work that wouldn't have been possible without um, that, that pioneering study of, of Dr. Abur. So let me just mention that this work took a village, and I'm just the person standing out here representing all the many different institutions and, and, uh, that were involved and um, and are carrying this work forward. So I'm going to shift gears here now because many people have asked me in the last few weeks whether this treatment is uh, the treatment that you now need for AMN patients as well. And let, let me give you my opinion and bias, which is no, it is not the treatment for AMN patients uh, for several reasons. I think there are clearly it's a, this is an important milestone, 100 years after the first description of this disease, but there are still significant limitations of this ex vivo approach. First, as you've noticed, uh, it takes time, both for bone marrow transplantation as well as for lentiviral gene therapy, to kick in, and, and in this time, the patients progress. Um, there are adverse events consistent with myeloblation, but more importantly, there have been first studies that have shown that even after bone marrow transplantation, patients develop AMN. There's been a nice study, a small study coming out of Amsterdam. There are also um, studies that show that um, um, uh, in, in our lab that are now showing that AMN really requires broad delivery to the spinal cord and peripheral nerve, and very few cells delivered uh, to the spinal cord are, are found in, in uh, the mouse model of ALD after transplantation. So, are there other approaches for AMN? And I'm just going to briefly outline what I think is going to happen in the next few years. And Asif gave me his slot of time, so I think I'm okay. Yeah. Just feel in, yeah. free to interrupt me if I'm going too for long. So um, I think in the coming years, we're going to see other uh, modes of uh, gene correction. And we got particularly interested in AAV gene correction, since we think it uh, allows for a faster, more robust, direct transduction and this has been exciting, particularly as there are many trials now using AABs, and we see this now with uh, even infants with spinal muscular atrophy that are undergoing successful treatment with AAB9. And recently, um, Jerry Mandel reported results of a first trial in 15 infants that had been successfully uh, treated with AAB9. So why am I mentioning spinal muscular atrophy together with adrenal myelinopathy. Well, they are both target, they both uh, have a disease and pathology within the spinal cord. And I think it's important to uh, leverage that, that uh, insight and success in SMA uh, to say whether maybe AAV can target neurodegeneration in the spinal cord regardless of whether it's SMA or AMN. The spinal cord uh, structure that is uh, targeted in spinal muscular atrophy is the lower motor neuron, as shown here in these little red dots. Um, so that anterior motor neuron is the target in SMA. In AMN, the targets are dorsal root ganglion cells, astrocytes, microglia, endothelial cells. And we think in particular, all the glia cells that support cortical spinal tracts and dorsal columns. Notice that these sit in very close vicinity in the spinal cord to where the lower motor neuron is. So we got interested in this and, and decided that we were going to package uh, AB, human ABCD1 gene into an AB9, and, and, um, and we found that we could successfully do that and deliver to the right cell types in a dish, and not just to the right cell types, but we actually got to the right cell compartment. Remember, the ABCD1 sits on the peroxisome, and we were able to show that we could deliver the ABCD1 uh, to those cells uh, uh, into that right compartment um, of the peroxisome. And importantly, also show that we could lower very long chain fatty acids as shown in the bottom right-hand corner. 
So it's all fine that you can do this in a dish that you can deliver to the right cells, but are you actually bringing about now a benefit uh, and showing functional improvement? Well, first we have to show that we can do this in an animal model before we can go to a human. And I'm just going to show you an example of a lot of work that's been going on in our lab um, where we've been able to show that we can correct uh, the motor deficits and the sensory deficits in a mouse model of um, AMN. When uh, earlier it was mentioned that there are three mouse models that were developed in 1997, we've been uh, whining about them ever since. But I, th I think that nevertheless, we've been able to show that they are of benefit both in showing that we can correct the biochemistry and also some of the behavior. And we find that the clasping behavior is probably one of the most uh, consistent uh, phenotypes of this mouse that occurs around 15 months when these mice pull their uh, hind limbs to their body and, and, and show clasping behavior that uh, we can reverse if we treat with AAB9. So we found that the best approach is uh, by intrathecal delivery and we are now uh, currently optimizing that intrathecal delivery to uh, better target the spinal cord and also reduce the peripheral leakage into the uh, bloodstream. And we've been uh, here working with Gauping, uh, Bumping Gao at UMass and some very talented postdocs in my lab to help uh, target that spinal cord and, and deliver exactly to the right cell types where we think we can bring about a benefit. <coughs> and we've been uh, doing that with various modalities. Um, one is by just showing that we can deliver green fluorescent protein by an intrathecal osmotic pump to the right cell types. And you can see different cells here within the lumbar region of the spinal cord, the thoracic region, and the cervical region of the spinal cord. And as you increase doses, you can see that much more green is present, meaning as you, as you uh, go from double the dose from uh, 1.5 to 3, here you see twice as much uh, green expression, and you get into uh, the cell types that are important for um, uh, ALD and AMN, astrocytes, endothelial cells, and microglial cells. <coughs> So I'm, I'm just going to briefly summarize this more complicated slide by saying we also found that we, we, we were able to dramatically reduce the systemic leakage of the, of the uh, viral vector and the protein uh, in, in, in the peripheral blood um, by using this slow uh, in, um, intrathecal osmotic pump uh, delivery. And this is also exemplified here where you find a lot of ABCD1 expressed in spinal cord and the DRGs, but very little in the heart. Okay. And we think that, that that's actually very important because we've seen that there, uh, there are adverse events if you see, have too much ABCD1 in cardiac tissue. So just the last slide to summarize this, we get into the DRGs. We think this is the dorsal root ganglion cells that sit next to the spinal cord that are those cells that are important for all the sensation that you experience if you have AMN and you have uh, sensory deficits, numbness, tingling, if you can't, uh, if your uh, balance is poor, that is because